Members, that's uh, the end of the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And Mr. Easton is not in his place, so I call Mr. David. Oh, oh there he is. Okay, excuse me, <laughs> Ali. So, Mr. Ali Easton. Thank you. Um, could not I ask his usual the, place. Yes. <laughs> could I ask the First Minister, how do you see the process moving forward after the recent Haas talks? Well, what is required uh, if we are to move forward in Northern Ireland is to reach agreement on outstanding issues. Uh, I think that uh, the unfortunate element of the Haas process has been that uh, while we now know what Dr Haas and uh, Professor O'Sullivan uh, believed would be able to gain widespread support uh, with the, the parties, uh, we do not have itemised the level of agreement that there might be in any of the hundreds of elements of that overall proposal. So I think it's necessary for a working group to, to sit down, to work out where there had been agreement and to uh, identify areas where further work is uh, required. I hope all the, the parties uh, are up for that. Uh, I know that uh, the uh, Ulster Unionist and Alliance Party have both indicated that they're willing to be part of such a process. I was pleased to see in the House of Commons Dr Alistair MacDonald uh, indicate that he was willing to be, indeed was urging uh, the Secretary of State to be involved in a process that would do precisely that. My party is certainly uh, up for it. So I, I hope that uh, when the, the party leaders meet tomorrow that they can reach that kind of agreement. I call Mr Easton for a supplementary. Could I thank the First Minister for his answer. Um, who should cherish uh, the next step of the process and does he envisage Mr Haas returning? <laughs> I think <his> laugh is... uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think there, there are laws against uh, inhumane treatment, uh, so <laughs> I, I'm not sure that uh, we would uh, want to, to push uh, Dr. Haas to, to return. Uh, I think certainly uh, I would be very happy if he did return, but uh, I suspect when he indicated that uh, he was leaving on the 31st of <coughs> December and wasn't going to go beyond that, that that is his uh, fixed position. Uh, I note that the Secretary of State has offered uh, herself to uh, chair the next phase uh, of the, the process. Again, I, I'd be quite content with that. But uh, the choice of who chairs has been left with the five parties collectively. That was how Dr. Haas uh, was uh, appointed. So I suspect if the parties are agreeable to a further phase, then the parties themselves will determine who it will be appropriate to chair. Thank you. I call on Mr. David Hildridge. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, First Minister, are you aware of the statement made by the Dard Minister criticising the Finance Minister uh, for taking court action over her failure to bring uh, her decision on the cap reform to the executive? And if so, what comment do you have in relation to it? Well, I, I wasn't uh, in for that part of uh, the Dard Minister's statement. I came in at the tail end of the statement, so she clearly made the remarks before I, I entered. Um, I'm not sure it's altogether appropriate for the Dard Minister to, to make uh, comments uh, if they were made in the, the fashion that is suggested. I would have thought that uh, the person who has uh, breached the ministerial code and be found to have acted unlawfully is not in a strong position uh, to censor the person who drew attention to such a breach. Thank you, Principal Deputy and thank the First Minister for his answer. But what are the implications, do you believe, the decision would have for the operation of the executive? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, this isn't the first time we've been faced with uh, these kind of judgments. There's been a uh, series of uh, rulings uh, from the High Court, and this one, remember, was from the Lord Chief Justice, uh, that have indicated the necessity uh, to. Uh, bring any matter which is uh, significant or controversial or cross-cutting uh, to the executive. Uh, that remains a position. I think it does require each minister to reflect more closely on the decisions that they are taking and whether they fall within those categories. Uh, of course, we have not yet seen the written judgment of the Lord Chief Justice on this matter, which uh, might uh, be helpful to us. Uh, but I, I really do think that the, the executive does need to sit down and decide how it operates in, in terms of taking decisions. We don't want to grind an executive to a, a standstill, but it is necessary that uh, if there are decisions to, to be taken that are pointed up by other ministers as being controversial or significant or cross-cutting, then the minister should not try and avoid the requirement that is laid down uh, in the ministerial code to bring it to the, uh, the executive. 
Thank you, and I call Ms. Stewart, Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, First Minister, one of the positives coming out of the Haas talks was uh, a proposal uh, agreed by all parties that the Victims Commissioner should assess better ways uh, to meet the financial needs of those seriously injured as a result of the past. Is the First Minister prepared with the uh, Deputy First Minister to add direction to the terms of the Victims Commissioner's terms of reference to deal with this matter now? Well, I am sometimes overcome by the enthusiasm of some parties in the, the Chamber to get the Deputy First Minister and I to do various things, though those same parties are the parties that uh, talk about a, a DUP, Sinn Féin, uh, carve-up or tag team. Uh, if the five parties sat down as part of a panel and reached agreements, then the five parties should bring those agreements that they reached as required by their terms of reference to the Deputy First Minister and myself. They have yet to do that. Uh, we have had Dr. Haas's view uh, of the, the matter. We have not had uh, any paper from the panel which was required under the terms of reference indicating the areas where there are agreement. Uh, and all of the areas where there are agreement, uh, I believe, if they are capable of moving forward uh, on their own, we'll certainly be prepared to, to look at that, and that can be brought to the, uh, the executive. But the first job, I believe, of that panel is to sit down, go through the 340 elements of agreement that are contained within the Haas proposals, and each of them determine whether they agree with those elements to see how many of those overall level uh, elements of agreement uh, are shared by all of the, the five parties and therefore can be acted upon. Call Mr. Stuart Dixon for a supplementary. Um, thank you to the First Minister for his comments. Uh, First Minister, a proposal has been made with regards to a pension for those uh, with uh, conflict-related serious injuries. What actions or proposals have you to take or comment to make on that proposal? Well, I think the, the comment I make is the same that I made earlier, that for us to, to look at any set of proposals, it is necessary for the panel to bring them forward. The panel has yet not done that. Uh, and I, I really do suggest that the requirement that we set down in our terms of reference for the panel, not Dr. Haas, for the panel to bring forward the areas of uh, agreement, the panel should meet to carry out that uh, obligation that is placed on them so that we can look at each of the individual proposals that are agreed by all. I call Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Deputy. Uh Speaker, I'm sure the Minister will be pleased uh, that I'm moving away from the Haas talks. And we, as we are discussing topical questions, the Minister will be aware that today one of the most courageous clergymen to emerge during the Troubles, the Reverend David Armstrong, called on the former First Minister to apologise for deeds or words of the past. Would the First Minister agree with me that the ability to say sorry for the past is an essential element? of permanent peace and reconciliation here. Well, I'm not sure that the, the member has moved away from the, the Haas proposals because, of course, contained within the Haas proposals, uh, there was a, an issue relating to uh, acknowledgement of the, the past. Uh, I have to say that I do not want to acquit those who operated within the democratic process with those who went out and quite deliberately uh, killed and maimed uh, individuals yeah, uh, yeah, in our society. Yeah. So uh, I think that all of us, uh, when we make mistakes, and there is not one in this chamber that has not done so, uh, we should be prepared to uh, indicate that we have made those uh, mistakes. It is a lesson not just for party leaders, but perhaps for party members, and not just for DUP party leaders, but also for those who are members of the SDLP. I call Mr. Dallet for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, I uh, welcome the First Minister's response. And if I have said something in the past which was wrong, I apologise publicly for it. Would he now encourage his former party leader to do likewise? Well, I, I imagine that is a public apology from the, the member for the SDLP support of a play park named after a, a terrorist uh, in County Down. Uh, and uh, the, we will all note that. Uh, he's shaking his head, so he clearly doesn't apologise for the, the, the past. Uh, let me say this uh, in relation to the, the programme that uh, seems to have stirred up this, uh, this interest. Uh, Ian Paisley has been a, a major figure yeah. in public life in Northern Ireland for many generations. Uh, he was uh, active uh, while most of us in this uh, chamber 
uh, were either not born or were in short uh, trousers or in plaid skirts. Uh, the, the fact remains, he made an enormous contribution to yeah. the, the life of Northern Ireland. He has a fantastic legacy that he has uh, left down. Uh, it, saddened me, it saddens me that it is being portrayed in the way that uh, this programme appears to, to do it, uh, but it does not take away from the very significant role that he has uh, played. But I honestly believe that uh, if uh, we are going to have interviews about the past, it is far better to have them when they are fresher in people's memories. Thank you. And I call Lord Morrow. Uh, thank you. Can I ask the First Minister if he could outline the position with regards to the Social Investment Fund? Yes, yeah, so, well, well, here again, real progress uh, has been made. As uh, I understand it, uh, the uh, officials have been uh, working uh, on uh, looking at the approval of uh, those that have already gone through the economic uh, appraisal. I believe that uh, literally within the next two or three weeks, uh, we'll be in a, a position to, to move forward with the, the first tranche of those, uh, which amounts to about, uh, well, over £30 million. Pounds. Well, Lord Morrow, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the First Minister for his response. Can the Minister further tell us how many projects are in a position to have letters of offer uh, offered to them? Well, uh, as I understand it, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the number that have already been uh, approved and have gone through the system amount to about uh, 22 schemes, but I understand that there are 14 that are virtually ready uh, as well. Uh, and of course, these are schemes that uh, are on the ground right across the province and will benefit local communities. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sidney Anderson. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the First Minister indicate what indications the decision in the DFP Dard case over the Christmas period will have for the Dixon Plan for Education in the Craigavon Tandagi area? <laughs> All politics is local, uh, Mr. <laughs> Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I think I have always held the, the view that uh, the decisions being taken in relation to uh, the, the Dixon plan in the Craigavon uh, and surrounding area uh, was such that it would have to come to the executive. Um, I believe that uh, it would certainly be regarded as significant and controversial. Uh, if there is finance involved, it also becomes uh, cross-cutting. Uh, so uh, I think it is the, the recent decision is just a confirmation of what we already knew, and that was that such matters are matters that have to be brought to the executive. Thank you. And I call Mr Anderson for a supplement. Uh, thank you, and I thank the, the First Minister for that response. But can the First Minister indicate what steps would be taken if the Education Minister decided not to bring the decision to the executive? Well, it, it's a hypothetical question, uh, Mr Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I have no reason to believe that the... Uh, education Minister wouldn't bring it to the Executive. Indeed, the Education Minister might, uh, on reflection, uh, take a different position than that which has been adopted heretofore, uh, and therefore it wouldn't be necessary to, to bring it to the, uh, the Executive. But uh, very clearly there, there are mechanisms uh, in place, both within this Assembly, where 30 or more members, if they sign a uh, petition of concern, can have the matter referred to the Executive. Any three executive uh, ministers can require the matter to be brought to the executive. The deputy first minister and I, acting jointly, can bring it to the, uh, the executive. So there are a number of ways that it can be brought there. But I, again, I repeat, I don't have any reason to believe that the education minister won't himself bring it to the executive if it requires a decision. Thank you. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. First Minister, could I ask you? When Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan were leaving, they said these proposals were not self-implementing. Could I ask you, as First Minister, what are your short-term goals for the, for the implementation plan? Well, I think that the member is confused. Uh, he needs to look again at the terms of reference. Uh, we don't simply throw a number of people into a room and say, get on with it. We give them terms of reference, and they act upon those terms of reference. The terms of reference place a responsibility on the panel of the parties to bring forward proposals where they have reached a agreement. They haven't done that as yet. I now know very clearly what Dr. Haas and Professor O'Sullivan's view was of what might be able to gain uh, widespread uh, acceptance. It's clear that it doesn't, 
and therefore it is up to the parties to identify within those proposals those elements that they can all agree to, or indeed where there is a sufficient consensus that can agree to them, uh, and therefore bring them forward so that the Deputy First Minister and I can then decide what the appropriate next steps would be. Thank you. And uh, that is time up for topical questions, and we must now move on to questions.